strategies that haven't been proven yet. Oh, recording just started. <laughs> Any of the technologies that haven't been proven yet um, to assure that you're still moving towards um, nitrogen reduction and habitat restoration to have a backup plan using a conventional technology that has been proven to work, such as um, um, sewers or packaged treatment plants. And we would assure that that's backed up per sub-watershed rather than the overall um, nitrogen reduction goal for well fleet. So, so the transfer station um, site is the contingency plan? So I believe that's a disposal location um, in which a design for a sewer system could have a treatment facility disposed for a groundwater discharge facility there. Oh. So we know that the transfer station can accept a certain amount of, of gallons, um, but we have to do more work to sort of get better detail on how it would work and how the wastewater would get to that location. Yes, so um, per sub watershed, um, the nitrogen allocation per house, what houses would potentially come off of septic and connect to the sewer. And we would count that towards um, the goal for the contingency plan. And Charlie, that's, um, we, you and I spoke, I don't know, I lose track of time, um, about extending the contract with GHD to do additional work to, to, to further along the contingency plan. So Brian and Drew, um, we've asked Anastasia to put together sort of a scope of work for us that I will then share with you guys just to make sure we're, we're heading in that right direction. So I'll jump in. The, the thing that might be hard for Hillary to say, but I'll say on her behalf, is where Wellfleet's gotten itself into trouble it, historically has been there are people in town who have sort of put out the notion that you can jump to these alternatives because they're going to work and skip the necessary step of developing the planning and the analysis and the high level uh, review of a conventional treatment and disposal option um, because of their faith in the alternative. And despite years of conversation, saying, no, you actually need to do this planning exercise and need to have that back pot in your back pocket, the plan B, in order to be able to proceed with some regulatory certainty, um, that message has had a hard time penetrating into the consciousness of certain members of the Water Quality Committee. And it has made it difficult and confusing, I think, for the town to understand the direction that they're going in, because there are folks that think that if you um, do the plan B, that that somehow undercuts your messaging and belief in the alternative. And the reality is, whether that's true or not, it's a regulatory reality that in order to proceed with this other stuff, you got to have the evaluation of the conventional system approach in place in order to be able to proceed and you guys have gotten kind of wrapped around the axle internally on that issue and it's just simply not something that's worth fighting um, it's a reality and it's also a necessary precondition to having access to state assistance through the srf and then being able to tap into the cape and islands water protection trust funds to supplement whatever it is you end up doing so that's my two cents on that yeah, issue. Yeah, so what you're saying is even if we're pursuing these uh, alternative solutions, we've got to do that engineering effort and analysis? It's, it's, a, it's a modified engineering effort yeah. analysis. We're not, we're not talking about a full-blown plan here. And, um, you know, and I think if you get GHD on board, um, we'll be able to discuss with them you know, what level, you know, we, we want to 
take it to. Um, and, you know, I just, I <clears throat> would back up what Andrew has said because, um, and Hillary knows this, that when the informal draft of the CWMP um, that had been prepared by environmental partners back in 2014 was given to us for review. You know, I sat down with both Hillary and Dan Hort, who was, you know, the town administrator at the time. Um, and that was the first thing I said. There is no, that, you know, at that time, it was dependent almost entirely on shellfish agriculture. Uh, and, and I said, there is absolutely no backup plan here and we cannot proceed. And this was even, you know, prior to forming what the watershed permit requirements were and targeted watershed management plans and all that. And I said, we cannot proceed unless there is a contingency plan. Um, and every subsequent meeting that we have had where there has been pushback on that, we have held firm. Um, so none of this, you know, none of this is a surprise, um, but, you know, we have kind of got wrapped around the axle because there have been certain people who just don't get the message. Yeah, I mean, I'll be, I'll, let, me, let me put a finer point on that. Kurt, Kurt won't accept the message and nobody in prior either boards of selectmen or town administrators have backed Hillary sufficiently to allow for that reality to be accepted by the, the town. And it's, it's actually lengthened the review process lengthen the ability to go to action because there's still this fantasy belief in pockets of people in Wellfleet that you don't have to expend the resources to do this plan B and we can just jump to implementing alternatives. And I'm not trying to say the alternatives won't work. I'm agnostic about whether they will or they won't, but you can't shortcut the process. And Period, I, full stop, end of conversation. Yeah, and I think, um, we're just now, after I don't even know how many years, um, getting to the point where like the contingency plan, the, the sewer plan is becoming more of a thing that people recognize that we have to do. Now, they understand we have to do it, but now they're pushing, pushing back and saying, well, do we have to do it in the first five years while we're testing out these other technologies? And the message from DEP has been loud and clear. Um, yes, we need to do it and we need to do it now. But, but so now we're, we're at the point where, well, maybe we could do these other things and get the data and then work on the contingency plan. But so I think in Wellfleet, we just have to continue to drive home the message that we need the, the full roadmap before we do anything or have anything. We don't have anything without the contingency plan. So- and so I'm sorry now, uh, this is me catching up, but so Hillary, that's what you're trying to do with GHD is to get some costing on a scope of services to, yes. to get us in a better place. We don't have any funding appropriated. We have very little money left. We've spent um, over $500,000. And I think Lisa knows that because she was surprised that it took us the amount of time we did to spend that. But we've spent a lot of money and we, we are not there yet. So we still need to spend probably a decent amount of money to get where we need to go. And okay. these, these projects that are on the warrant do not further our cause for that. Yeah, all right. Um, so uh, just for Brian and for the gang here, um, you know, I mean, <laughs> to say we have some financial challenges is just a bit of an understatement, and I, I have no clue right now. So, uh, but I think, um, but I have a nice team in place to work on it. Uh, Mary McIsaac and Lisa Sauvay. So I'm kind of very confident in those two women. It's just going to take us several months. My thinking is um, we can't get free cash certified. We haven't had it certified for a long time because our books are such a mess. Um, but um, I, what I'm really, and I've been talking to the FinCom and to the select board about is having a fall special town meeting. Um, one, I think there's gonna be a lot of issues I uncover that I'm gonna have to remedy at the town meeting going forward. And, and, and if we can position ourselves, Hillary, um, 
you know, maybe that would be the time to go get the, the, this funding for GHD, I believe. So yeah, we can show a good faith effort here. Absolutely. And I think we do have money um, from a previous warrant article to, to fund GHD, depending on what they get back to us with. So right. um, we got to kind of pull the reins on Scott and expend the money to GHD. You know, if you get a scope of work from them, um, and you know, if you if you don't mind, you know, letting us know at least ballpark what you're talking about for yeah. for budget, I think maybe we can put our heads together and scale something appropriately, so you know that you can work within work within your means, and then we can get what we what we want. Yeah. Um, Has anybody looked at the fact that? You know, this is a good SRF eligible planning project. I mean, the yeah. SRF funds these these planning projects. You know, if it's in my experience, any CWMP planning project that is slightly better than the back of an envelope gets funded. The bar the bar for funding these planning projects is pretty damn low. And oh, really? that yeah, that would allow you to you know, treat it as a borrowing and, you know, pay it back over the long term in terms of your current cash flow problems, Charlie, and your certification problems with free cash and what you've got is available for appropriation. It would go a long way towards solving your problem and allow you to proceed at the same time. Yeah, you know, the nice thing about that, too, would be, I mean, everything they do now because of the fiscal uh, thing is a prop two and a half override, you know, even like shelving in the town clerk's office, they get an over, they, no offense, Hillary. <laughs> I mean, I'm really kind of like, oh my God. Um, but uh, they they get a borrowing authorization and ex an exemption. So, you know, I, I'd hate to, that would be nice because then we wouldn't have to subject this to a um, prop two and a half override, which would be kind of a right. big So, you know, I don't, I don't know what the you know, the, it, it, there's, a, there's a timing question about, you know, getting, a, you know, getting on the 2022 list, um, you know, it might be longer than we want to wait, but I, it might be worth having a con an internal conversation, Brian, with, with somebody in municipal services and Maria's yeah. office. They're really not happy with me at the moment, um, with <laughs> having their, uh, their tiering, SRF tiering thing. So I'm the wrong person to initiate that conversation right now. So okay. I don't know whether they have any. I don't know whether they have any discretionary funds within what they've set aside for emergencies or the like. Whether they could, you know, make some kind of commitment to the town that would allow Charlie to, you know, factor that into his planning. But I think it's worth it's worth having that conversation. Okay. Yeah, we can we can see if we can find something out and let you guys know. Um, you know, the other thing that I I also want to say is that. You know, while the current projects that you have on the on the upcoming warrant um, <clears throat> are not going to solve the problem, um, they will. You know, they certainly can be integrated as part of the solution once you get your um, your planning done. And as we did with the Pleasant Bay watershed permit, you know, we we will give credit um, where appropriate for any, you know, prior projects that, that have been done specifically for nitrogen removal. Um, you know, the IA, the IA um, program, you know, right now I'd say is, is, is a lot more speculative because we don't know, you know, how um, the performance of those systems ultimately is going to pan out in terms of what credit we can do. But I think the 95 Lawrence project um, is, is something that's a little bit more rock solid because that's a conventional treatment. Um, and I did talk with Scott about that um, and that he believes uh, that the existing septic loads that will be part of the initial phase of that, that, you know, most notably the town buildings um, will, will be sufficient to make that 
a, ni a net zero nitrogen project. So that's a, and that's a huge hurdle to overcome with that. Um, I also want to let you guys know that Scott and I are actually going to sit down together on Monday and start going over his nitrogen loading calculations um, so that we can, um, you know, we can, we can set on numbers. Um, right. and, and we're going to use the actual numbers that came out of MEP. I, he had been, um, I think, using some estimates because he didn't have access to the same data. So we're going to um, we're going to we're going to really try to hone that in, and um, and I think that's going to be a big jump in in getting things moving. Um, when you hone in on those numbers, is it your thought that sort of the enhanced IA approach in downtown and you know? anywhere short of South Wellfleet will go out the, out the door? I don't know. Um, I, what we're, what we're going to be doing initially is looking at what the actual loads are based on um, the, you know, the land use loading model that was used in the MEP report. Okay. So use utilizing those actual data points. Um, and I've been working on that and Drew's been working on that. Okay. Um, and and then I think from there, that's where we'll start to talk about uh, where we would be looking at, you know, potentials because you know we can, you know, we can run different scenarios just to get a, a, a rough idea of what you'd be looking at. But I think also at the same time, um, you know, if if you get Anastasia on board, um, yeah. we I think we'll also be able to sit down with them and and map out uh, a close strategy for um, a, a conventional contingency plan. So I also have this question and I feel like I ask it at every meeting we're always at and there's a disconnect for me. When does the roadmap or the option plan get shopped out to the community? Like I still am unclear on how you ask your town, like, gee, do you do you just want to go for the sewer, or do you wanna do you wanna tinker with these other things? Like, I, I and I ask you this all the time, and you give me an answer, and I come back, and I'm still not clear. Well, I, I, you know, it's 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 up to you guys, really, how, you know, how you want to roll it out. Um, what I have seen in other communities um, is, you know, with an active, you know, wastewater implementation committee or wastewater advisory committee, um, you know, they, they, they open those kinds of discussions up to a public process. So, you know, people can have the opportunity for, for input. Um, does that, does that look like a standard wastewater committee meeting at two in the afternoon, they have it on the agenda and people have to be following the subject matter to show up. Like, I, I know, I- I, I, mean, I, I, I mean, Hillary, let me, let me tell you how we did it in Mashpee. And it's Please. not necessarily the best example in the world, but it illustrates what Brian said. So we had, you know, we had a conventional system approach, sewer commission passed it along to board of selectmen, Board of Selectmen said, screw you, we're not doing this. Um, sent it back. They came up with sort of a blended approach, you know, reliance on some conventional treatment, reliance on some alternative. Um, that got, you know, a broader public discussion, but it was still very much in the context of the sewer commission work. Um, ultimately, it came up to the Board of Selectmen, and I forced a vote a discussion and a vote to sanction and adopt the plan as the blueprint for what Mashpee was gonna do. Okay, so public process. That sanction didn't actually signify that the broader public or even the Board of Selectmen that voted to support it understood it and really supported it. 
Okay. And then it was only after we kind of said, all right, this is our plan. And then we started getting to the point of preparing articles to engineer, to spend money to engineer what we said we were going to do, the people really started to pay attention. Okay? okay. At that point, we had to loop back again and hold a series of IL every other week meetings for like four months where we actually revisited the whole damn plan as a way of getting people oriented to what was going to go to town meeting. So it's a very amorphous, squishy, repetitive process through which you have to, it's like making your kids eat their vegetables. You got to put it on the plate 17 times, right? <laughs> um, and, you know, they spit it back at you 16 times. Eventually, they'll eat it. And that's what ends up happening. So you have to, you have to do it multiple times to the point where you feel we've brought this back to you and we've told you this five times already. Um, but the real focus on whether we're going to proceed or not will only come when the article to spend the money is in front of the board of selectmen, in front of the finance committee, and then in front of town meeting. So you got to do all this predicate lay of the groundwork work, but the come to Jesus moment on, are we really going to do this? Isn't until the Warren article drafted. Okay. So now we're in this really weird place because we have pieces of what I think will be in the plan on the warrant. And there is confusion. Uh, there's, there's confusion. There's a lot of questions and people never feel like they get the right answers. Um, and they're confused because it, it's been such a strange process, right? So like the best answer that I give to people now about like why these things are on the warrant is because, well, I speak for the environment and they're good for the environment, right? Like we're not causing harm, like these things are helpful but without the roadmap, they don't really count for much right now. And perhaps they position us for grant funding from the federal government in some way that I'm not aware of yet either, right? And, and certain members of the committee feel like this is a vote of the town consenting to these options as our wastewater plan. Like without right. the town meeting vote, we can't do these projects. So like the financial piece has never been my strong point and I've never claimed it to be. So I sort of stay out of that piece of the discussion and just stay focused on what I think I know we need to do regulatorily. And so it's always so awkward. Yeah, I mean, I think, again, this is what I can say and you, nobody else on the call can. I think because you have a leadership vacuum at your board of selectmen, slash manager's office or historically it's ceded control of this discussion to Kurt um, and Kurt doesn't get or care about what the process is and is trying to get the town committed to a non-conventional approach and so yeah it doesn't surprise me that the vote on these particular alternatives is being seen as a proxy for the town wants to do alternatives in the absence of a plan. And I don't know the local political lay very enough to know whether, this, you know, you, you could take the approach to say, you know, yeah, these are all progress. And so progress is good. Uh, and we'll do our plan at the same time and sort out the confusion later. And that might be the good thing. Or there's also an argument to be made, given the circumstances that you're in, to say, stop the music. The focus of this has to be on the plan. We can't keep doing things piecemeal. We don't have the resource to do things piecemeal and to take a little bit, use it as a reason to take a hiatus from where Kurt's pushing you as long as there's the ability to have the central management of the town take control of the messaging and the planning. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Orleans, I think, also provides a, a, another example um, a little bit different from, you know, the mash from the Mashby example in that, um, you know, they, they had a, 
CWMP that was approved, uh, when was it, back in 2014, I think. Um, and, you know, went to town meeting uh, after it had been approved to implement it. And, you know, they, they lost funding for that by six votes of the super majority, you know, so, you know, 60, you know, 66% of the town, you know, approved it. It just, you couldn't get to the 66.7, you know, to get, to get the two thirds. Um, and, you know, and that, and that delayed things. So what they ended up doing, and it was because there was a certain faction in town who was insistent that the science was wrong. And then when that argument fell apart, that it was too expensive. Um, and when, you know, and that we, you know, we could do things with all these alternatives and all that stuff. Um, so what the town ended up doing was having a facilitated process of this, with this committee that was established with town stakeholders from the various groups like the Orleans Pond Coalition, the, uh, the this group of that can, they call themselves the peer review group who questioned everything. They were the skeptics. Um, yeah. Yeah. Orleans Taxpayers Association, you know, everybody. Um, and then, and those were like the voting members. And then they invited, you know, DEP, the commission, um, even East Ham to participate. Uh, EPA could participate if they wanted. I think we got somebody from the seashore. Um, and, you know, we had monthly meetings and these were like three to four hour marathons and, but they were facilitated by the Consensus Building Institute. Yeah. And that went on for a year. Um, and the agreement was that whatever came out, you know, it was gonna be a compromise and not everybody was gonna be happy. In fact, nobody was probably gonna be happy, but we were all gonna support it. Um, and that fell apart a, a tiny bit at the edges when a couple of the people, you know, constituent groups would not honor that commitment. But ultimately, um, it came up with the plan that was reflected in the watershed permit uh, partially, um, but did result finally in funding for the construction of, of the collection system and the, and the treatment plan for downtown right now. And then that's going to expand to Meeting House Pond, you know, in a, in a couple years. Um, so that's another way. That's another way of doing but, it. But but, but the similarity in the two cases, Brian and Hillary and Charlie, is that you had somebody on the board of selectmen in the Orleans case, yep. Alan McLennan, driving the bus, forcing yep. the issue, not letting people off the hook, and not turning it over to somebody with a um, whose agenda was more narrowly focused than solving the problem. I think Alan wanted to solve the problem. I wanted to solve the problem. I didn't really give a shit how we did it. Um, and I don't think Alan had a predetermined outcome as how we did it, or he could live with whatever the compromise. So you needed somebody, somebody has to take control of this local process. The problem is that you've got Kurt as the mouthpiece for the process end of things, and he ain't gonna get you anywhere. So, but you I know, know, I I also worry, Andrew, about our board of selectmen because, you know, they all have their own ideas on how it should be and right. research to the conclusion that they want. So, so, and I think, Charlie, it's been really difficult without, you know, someone in your seat invested in the project too, that, that adds clarity and helps the board see through the weeds. And I think our board of selectmen gets trapped up in the weeds all the time and like gets hung up on like one small point and can't move beyond that. So, so I guess that's why I'm the most hopeful I've been in years having you here, Charlie, because I think you have the experience. To oh, you can't like disappoint Hillary. Yeah. Like it's been years, Charlie. Years in the making. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, my only, you know, not to, I, I, you know, and, and I think that that 
the reality is, um, you know, clearly I've got problems to deal with and how long am I going to be here? You know, so um, I mean, I'd be glad to get engaged and participate. You know, I, I will tell you when I walked in the door that first week I met with Kurt and somebody else, I can't remember who, uh, Justina, I guess, maybe on your select board. And, and, they, and they were like, there were like 15 things that were going to be on the town meeting warrant for all of these elements. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so, and uh, now I did meet with Kurt and we narrowed it down to one that has now become three, which is fine. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> and that's fine. But, you know, now that I think, except for the 95 Lawrence, which seems to, that seems to make sense for other reasons as well. Um, so what these things that we're doing, I mean, they're very confident that they're going to work and we're going to get credit for it, but they are, they are not approved technology. So we are experimenting and taking a risk um, that may or may not pan out is what, Brian is really telling me here. But I guess the other the other piece of that too, and this is I, I've gone back and forth with Kurt about this, is even if it's on the warrant, we don't have to spend the money. So sure. we don't have to do any of these things until we have an approved plan. Yeah, and I will say too, by the way, all of these things, yeah, all of those these items are subject to a two and a half override too. So there's another. Mm -hmm layer of approval. I don't know. We have like 13 things on for overrides. So right. I mean if you had a plan, if you had a plan and a watershed permit that created a structure around which you were taking these risks, the risks would be less significant. Yes. Um, and so what you're doing now is spending money you don't have um, to solve a problem, to maybe solve part of a problem that you can't solve entirely by these solutions. So you know, I think, I think Hillary makes a good point. You know, if, if pulling them from the warrant is untenable, that's fine. Um, but just because the phone rings doesn't mean you have to answer it. Just because you have the appropriation doesn't mean the board has to spend the money. And you could recommend to them that they sequence, um, you know, authorizing these projects to proceed to come after the plan is in place. So the town knows, you know, has a more quantified risk of what the value of proceeding is versus doing some other thing. And that might be a way, you know, that might be a way to provide some structure around this without, you know, turning it into a pre-town meeting, you know, battle to the death that is a battle you don't necessarily want to wage right now, given the other alternatives and challenges that are facing you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah the other thing about about I want to, get on, want to get on the mm -hmm. table, Charlie, is that, for 95 Lawrence, and I've had this conversation with Scott, you know, what Brian suggested about, you know, getting it to net zero is a, is a good start. The town also ought to think a little bit uh, and be aware of the fact that if you wanted to use SRF money to pay for the wastewater component of 95 Lawrence, you have to meet the SRF threshold of 85% of the flow being treated by the facility being existent, not new flow. And that means expanding the service area to not just net zero, but to make the majority of it, the wastewater going to that treatment plant from existing septic system. Um, you know, the value to you of doing that is that it gives you a line towards zero interest money for the wastewater facility. That then unlocks your access to the 25% subsidy through the Cape and Islands Trust Fund. So it has the potential to lower the cost of 95 Lawrence for wastewater, but also kind of sort of start to solve your existing flow problem at the same time. And, you know, if you're going to do that, then, you know, the project evaluation forms for SRF are open for filing now. Drew, I'm not sure what the deadline is sometime in August to file that, I think. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, that's a decision that you ought to think about sooner than later, so that if the project proceeds, you get a twofer out of it. You fund wastewater for your affordable housing project and you do it in a way 
to cost your residents 75 cents on the dollar. Um, and that would go a long way toward settling the debate about whether there's going to be some form of collection and treatment in the town or wealth fleet. Um, and then from there, you're planning to get a hell of a lot easier because you're building onto something that's already existing. It's a way around some of the nonsense that's heard, frankly. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, now I get it. See, I, yeah, see, I don't know what I'm doing. So I was thinking the 95 Lawrence might already be eligible for these programs, but it's not because, not. because not. of that, that threshold about existing versus new right. flow. And we had, I, right. had this, I had this debate with um, uh, what's her fate from um, uh, the former town manager uh, in Truro around Cloverleaf. And right. she's like, you know, we really want to be able to use this money for that purpose. Like, you can't unless you expand it to capture existing flows. And, mm -hmm. and she, wouldn't, she wouldn't budge on that. Um, and as a result, you know, it, that project's tracking the way it's tracking. But there's an opportunity here for you and Wellfleet to um, solve two problems at the same time and kind of lay the framework for what your long-term answer is going to be, um, but you're on the clock for it. So, you know, that's a that's a thing that you know GHD uh, and Anastasia, you know, they they she filed our project evaluation form last year. They do them all the time. It might be a short-term, near-term thing you'd want to assign them separately from this broader contract if you want to keep that option open for the town. What is the percentage, what is the percentage of existing flow versus new flow? I believe it's 85% of the flow needs to be existing 80, and existing flow being defined as uh, flow that was in existence of April 1, 1994. 1994. Okay. I, I mean, I, I think that's a good strategy, um, but I guess the one thing that I, I would caution, Andrew, maybe you can answer this better than I, but absent, um, you know, a CWMP or a TWMP, um, that project would only be eligible for 2% as opposed to 0%, correct? Uh, that is true, um, but it still unlocks the 70 to 25% interest yeah. forgiveness. Right. Forgiveness. Yeah. yeah. So it's still... It's still a big winner. And, you know, yeah. and I don't know whether they can accelerate, you know, I don't know how much, well, you'll be gone. So I don't know how much don't arm twisting that. Drew can live with. Uh, yeah. I don't know how much arm twisting Drew can live with to make it a TWP uh, to make it qualify. But that's a, that's a tomorrow problem and around the fringes of this. The core issue is, you know, do you want to try and expand the scope of the project to include enough flow that it makes the town at least eligible for a conversation? about SRF loans and principal forgiveness. Yeah, yeah well, we, we, should, we should try to do that because it just, um, it just makes a lot of sense. Um, okay. I can help you with that, Charlie, on the side. All right, yeah. And, and the, you know, and the thing is, is that, um, you know, all, all the other considerations aside, um, because, you know, this is an impaired watershed, even though it doesn't have a TMDL, but we have the, the scientific evidence pointing to it being an impaired watershed. It, it would, this project, because it's new construction would have to be nitrogen neutral. Um, and, and again, I mean, Scott seems to think that, you know, the existing municipal buildings will get us there, but if they don't, then that becomes another, um, that becomes another factor in expanding to existing residences and getting those septic systems off. Right. And once you do that, you might as well go to the SRF threshold and, and get the financial benefit of doing so. To probably make it a, a net neutral or even, you know, financially beneficial to the town to expand the project. Probably cost you less at the end of the day than it would just financing it on your own. Is there a, a grace period for which residents could hook up before this could move forward? Or do you need everyone connected and hooked up in order in order to receive the funding? We've taken we've taken a pretty hard line that well, not so much for receiving the funding, but just for getting the permit. Yeah. We've taken a we've taken a pretty hard line that we want 
we want connections. Okay. Com complete. Okay. Um, w within a period of time, though. Yeah. Well, that that there's a commitment that they're going to be that when that before before the treatment plan turns on those connections those connections are complete um okay now um most of what we have done have has been private um you know has been private permits and private facilities um where and i'm and i'm not committing to this yeah but where this is a municipal project and there's a little bit more um, assurance that you know that there that there will be connections. There is a possibility that we could have a discussion as to whether or not we would allow you know some grace period. Yeah. I'm not committing to that because it, it is like I said, it's not the way it's not the hard line that we've taken on other ones. But um, I have a little bit more faith that you know a, a town is going to uh, is going to honor that commitment rather than a private I mean, enterprise. I mean, what, what we told our voters back in May at town meeting was there's going to be mandatory connection, and the schedule is going to be set by regs adopted by our sewer commission. Um, the simple realities are obviously the treatment plant because these are existing homes. So the shit has to go somewhere. So they can't connect to a system that's not functioning yet. And at the same time, it's unrealistic for us to have 500 service connections all done on the same day, day one of the start of the treatment plant. And you probably don't want to start the treatment plant that way either. So, you know, it's we're committed to connect to forcing all of our residents of the sewer service area to connect. Um, we haven't set exactly the schedule. We'll have to hammer that out with DP and the permitting process, but our expectation and our commitment to people was if you're on one of the streets listed, you're connecting. And we'll get back to you with exactly what the schedule is going to be later. It's you know, from cause, cause, we got cause funding this year and we're not going to have our plant up and ready and running for another you know, it's a two year construction period starting next year. So yeah. it's you know you're giving people three years notice anyhow um, before it's even really an issue. Yeah, I, I didn't want to cause trouble, but I, I'm just thinking like in Howard, which I think they the notices are going to go out this summer, right? That the homes on on the route and they have to connect within some period of time. I think it's two years. But I'm not sure. And that's just like that's the reality of this and the wastewater problem on Cape Cod, right? We can't continue to sit around and do nothing while we're polluting the harbors and the estuaries. Well. Why do I want to build a facility if I'm not going to force people to connect to it? <laughs> yeah. Right? I mean, what's the point? So, you know, you have to for it. You have to. Yeah. You know, yeah. building the facility, committing to building any facility is at the same time a commitment to forcing your residents to connect. So you just got to make, you got to make your peace with that. Yeah. Oh, no, I agree. Based to strong leadership. We need strong leadership. <laughs> I'll find someone for you. <laughs> I'm old, guys. I don't know. I, I can't I can't move this ball without you and Brian. So all this talk about leaving and retirement's not gonna happen. Yeah, <laughs> no, we'll, 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 retirement's we'll overrated. <laughs> What'd you say, Brian? I said Drew Drew was a basketball star at WPI. He can move the ball very well. <laughs> and you should when you retire, why don't you run to move to Wellfleet and run for selectman? <laughs> yeah. And then you the can, only you way can I drive can... the, you can drive the agenda and fire Kurt. It'd be great. The only the only way I could afford to live at Wellfleet is if I lived at 95 Lawrence. <laughs> there you go. I know it's shocking, really. So yeah. good. Wow. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I think ahead, you painted the good picture for Charlie. Um, yeah, that helped me. Thank you. Yeah. 
I think you'll probably have to stew on all these conversations for a bit. And, and I know you'll have questions because it's impossible not to. So, so I think, you know, just understanding that this has been sort of my core team over the past, you know, 10 plus years. Um, and I think any one of these folks is, is more than willing and able to help us through this at any yep. time. Yeah, and if we can get some information, if we can get some information on that um, SRF planning process funding, that might be helpful. Yeah. yeah Charlie, that. Charlie, what I'm, what I'm, what I will offer to you that I've offered to Hillary and and Janet and others in the past is, you know, I'm happy to, you know, fill in the blanks. You know, Drew can, Drew can and Brian can give you kind of just the facts. I can tell you how to sort of what the realities of working with some of the stuff can be. I'm happy to come and speak to your board separately or in a public session about, you know, what the real challenges are about how to move this forward, how to put the town in the most advantageous position financially. Yeah, so. exactly. We, we, we help kind of creating a roadmap that is most advantageous to the town. Right. That's our job. Yeah, we've, we've had this discussion, as Hillary can attest, numerous times with various boards. But, you know, we got you just, we'll, we're happy to come help and repeat it um, multiple times if that's what you need in order to get some thought around a plan. Okay. Appreciate it, everybody. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you. Thank See you. you. See ya. So, hey, Brian, uh, congratulations. Retirement's overrated. Just want you to know that. I don't think I don't so. Think Brian's, I don't think Brian's going to have your problem, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> no. Andrew called me at 5 o'clock this morning. I was out in my daughter's oyster grant working for her for free. So anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going out tonight at 5.30. Anyway, all right. Well, take care, everybody. Thank you, guys. Bye. We'll see you. Uh, um, Hillary, I'll talk to you in a moment. Bye. Yes, we're going to stay on. Oh, am I just staying on? Yeah, we can. Is, is, um,